I uh, had an email exchange earlier today with Paul. There he is. And he said this would be a star moment. That was a very nice thing to say, Paul. Uh, since you are all architects, I uh, and I always thought that I, I was one too. Uh, I guess I still am, hopefully. Um, and uh, so speaking architect to architect, I wanted to share a few things that I have in my mind. Um, maybe I'll speak for 20 minutes or so, and then um, probably you guys have some questions. Um, last year, we wrote a, um, I had the honor to join a group of people who wrote a book uh, in the honor of Alan Kay. Uh, it was his 70th birthday last year. And um, there is this amazing book um, that is written in his, in his honor called Points of View. Um, and I had the privilege to write one chapter in there um, because he is a long, long time teacher of my life. And uh, um, the last chapter in this book is written by Danny Hillis, who is one of the smartest people in the world, I think. And uh, he talks about an architect as someone who has a unique combination of three things, uh, knowledge, imagination, and conviction. A vast knowledge of um, how things work, of the way the world is. Uh, an imagination to think about something really cool, really amazing that can change the world, and an absolute conviction. And the point of his, his chapter, it is, it is called uh, The Power of Conviction, is the name of the chapter. Uh, the point that he makes is that any two out of these three things by themselves are not that significant, or in fact, can be dangerous. But that conviction is the most important thing. And that is a conviction that these things that are, we know that, that are possible because of our knowledge, and that we know are attractive, are desirable because of our imagination, must be done. This conviction that we have to do it and to make that happen, uh, that conviction is the uh, missing piece. And he talked about how Alan had all three, and, and a lot of people, a lot of the greatest architects that we know uh, across history have the combination of these three things. So the unique, the interesting insight that I had was that these three dimensions, knowledge, imagination, and conviction, are actually quite similar, almost identical to the three dimensions of design thinking, desirability, feasibility, and viability. Uh, desirability talks about the end user dimension, the human dimension of anything that we do, any product that we build, anything that we do. Um, and imagination is about understanding the human. That is, so desirability and imagination are basically the same. Knowledge and feasibility are the same. Feasibility is about the engineering, the technology, the architecture of something. And that is very much the same as feasibility. So that means conviction must be the same as viability, must be the same as the economic value, the value, the, the reason to do something, uh, the economic potential. I believe that our thinking at SAP and more and more as we work with customers on this, is being shaped by design thinking. Um, we started in Hasso's leadership, uh, we started the design uh, team at SAP many years ago. And uh, Hasso, of course, invested in the, uh, and uh, made an endowment in the Stanford University Design School, which is now carries his name. And as we have gone forward, we have found that there is a lot of uh, focus in everything that we do on design thinking, on these three dimensions, desirability, feasibility, and viability. So now when you look at what is going on around us as, as architects, we are finding our, ourselves living in a time which is a very interesting time. Um, we all get a sense of a great transformation, a great change that is happening around us. And um, People talk about this in various ways, cloud computing, mobility, and, and uh, bring your own device and all these things. But what is really going on? And I have spent some time thinking about what is going on and trying to articulate that in a way that we can relate to. 
And I think that there are uh, a couple of things going on. One is that a lot of the curves that our industry depends on are of an exponential nature. And this is, a few years ago, Ray Kurzweil was here at TechEd, many of you might remember. And he talked about the singularity and so forth, and it was at the time a little bit out there, a little bit far out. But I think obviously as you look at hardware, for example, the price performance of hardware has gone through an exponential drop. Uh, main memory now is roughly 10 million times um, better in price performance than it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, so that's seven orders of magnitude. Um, same with hardware, CPUs, same with storage, um, same with networks, same with the price of communications, same with the price of connectivity. Uh, even software development tools, integration tools have all dropped very, very dramatically. And it is the nature of exponentials that the human brain finds it difficult to fathom these. And so exponential curves start off low and we don't see them until they suddenly hit, you know, and, and then um, very soon we lose track of them because they grow so fast. Um, I built this machine um, in May, this 100 terabyte system together with IBM. And this machine has since then, since in the last six months, the hardware itself dropped by about 25% in price. 25%. These are, uh, we bought 100 units of 40 CPU core, one terabyte uh, machines. We built the greatest HANA system in the world. And um, uh, now it is 25% cheaper, six months later, five months later. So it is quite, quite astonishing. Um, and when you think about this, you know, we still have 6,000 plus R3 systems running around the world, which are more than, you know, 15 years old and uh, out of the 50,000 or so ERP systems. So 15 years, I cannot even imagine what 15 years from now is going to be like. That's the year 2027. My goodness. Uh, you can imagine what it is like next year or what it is like the year after that. And if you just look at the nature of what things will be like, um, hardware, the same if it has dropped 25% in the last five months, by the end of next year, the Haswell processor from Intel will be out. Um, these will be, there will be a 128 CPU core, four terabyte DRAM machine, probably available for $25,000, $30,000 by the end of next year. Uh, there will be a massive um, CPUs, networks, uh, switch combination, storage combination that you'll be able to buy for incredibly cheap. Um, and then if you look at the world in 2014, and if you then further think about the world in 2015, probably this cluster is now one-eighth the price or one-sixteenth the price that I got it for in May of this year. Uh, if software development is ridiculously cheap, uh, if the containers, the hardware containers are that cheap, what does that mean for what we are doing? I think that is the question that we have to think about. Um, as, as technologies, as containers have commoditized, over centuries, uh, the value of the thought, the value of the human intent, the design, the purpose, uh, the content has become significantly more powerful. So we have to uh, think about this. The, the second thing that is going on is very clear, uh, end users are becoming more and more empowered. We talk about it in various ways, we talk about this in the context of people swiping credit cards and signing up for services. Uh, we talk about this in bring your own device. Um, we talk about this in various other factors. But the reality is people are becoming more empowered by technology to do their own thing. And this is actually not something recent. This has been going on for a very, very long time. Technology always serves to democratize things, to, to empower us, to amplify our reach. And that is, again, something that is going on. 